Um, and, because, and because the ambulance times aren't great in places like the Bronx, um, many people rush their children into emergency rooms themselves. So the, the location, the accessibility, the, 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 the existence of a facility like ours is, is very critical. Um, and already understaffing puts our ability to immediately assess and treat these patients uh, in danger. Um, but then you just have to ask the question and imagine, like, what if our hospital wasn't there? What, what would that actually look like? Um, <coughs> the closest pediatric emergency room, much less uh, uh, an advanced pediatric trauma center, um, is, is at least miles away, if not much further. And in New York City traffic, that um, means quite a bit. Um, so this, you know, this is the human face of privatization. Um, and I think, you know, it's what is the pre precise thing that um, the politicians who are making these cuts don't see or refuse to see, and that we as public sector workers actually have the responsibility to show to the world and to talk about and to make known. Um, in addition to revealing the human cost, um, however, I think we also need to arm ourselves with um, the facts and the knowledge of how exactly these cuts are being administered um, and, and in our specific situations. So I'd like to take some time to discuss um, some of the dynamics of privatization in healthcare, obviously with a focus on, on New York City. Uh, I work for a, a system called New York Health and Hospitals. Um, it was formerly called the Health and Hospitals Corporation. Um, and it's the largest remaining public hospital system in the United States. Um, being public means we don't turn anyone away, regardless of immigration status or ability to pay. Um, we get some money from the city of New York but most of our revenue comes from Medicare and Medicaid uh, for the patients we take care of. Uh, and then, of course, we absorb the cost of caring for those who can't afford to pay and, and the uninsured. Um, there are 11 major public hospitals in New York City um, with a network of clinics and other health care services. Overall, close to 9,000 nurses uh, who are represented by my union help to provide that health care to a total of approximately 1.4 million patients every year. So, you know, in New York, there's always been a fight around funding public health care. Um, you know, in the 1970s, one of the most famous uh, struggles um, coming out of the social movements of the time was uh, the Puerto Rican-based activist group, the Young Lords, actually occupied Lincoln Hospital in the South Bronx twice um, to highlight the, the chronic underfunding and, and the conditions in that hospital, um, which actually ultimately led to some improvements. There were there was some there was some funding that was that was put into the system in the 1980s, um, but in the 90s was really when they actually started to um, ratchet up the the movement to, pri for, to privatize the system. It was under Mayor Giuliani um, in the. In the mid-90s that actually attempted to close whole sections, whole entire hospitals within the system. Um, but it turns out he bit off more than he could chew uh, in that fight, and, and the resistance that emerged actually uh, pushed that off the agenda. Uh, so when Mayor Bloomberg took office in the 2000s, uh, he, they shifted tactics. They, they didn't try to close entire facilities. What they did was then try to close constituent elements or components of the system. So, and they actually were successful at this. So, they were able to privatize the dietary service. So, all the patient nutrition has been privatized. Uh, they um, privatized the environmental services. Um, and then, um, in terms of direct patient care, they actually were able to privatize the entirety of outpatient dialysis care to, uh, to a for profit company. Um, so when we at NISNA um, formed a, a rank and file slate um, five years ago, and uh, were able to successfully, um, you know, kick out the the sort of you know old old guard of our union, um, it was a it was one of the things that we vowed, you know, to sort of to take on is is this trend in our, in our public system. We're a thirty seven thousand member union, and about 12,000 12, of us. Uh, our, our, uh, our private, our public sector workers. Um, so, at that point, the city had had only private. 
like many fights, like by gathering information. So we, we devoted a lot of um, uh, resources to researching and gathering data about the patient outcomes in the, in the remaining health in the New York H&H &H facilities versus Big Apple dialysis. And actually the statistics were, were really staggering um, in terms of the gap um, uh, in terms of how patients were being cared for. Um, we took, we compiled this reports, we made it um, uh, both, you know, sort of substantive in terms of like, you know, big, thick, with full documentation, you know, things to give to, you know, politicians, but we also made it um, accessible to the public um, and, and, and talked about and bullet pointed it so that people could understand what, what was happening. Um, you know, the, the reasons, of course, why the outcomes were so much worse in the privatized facilities was because they immediately cut corners. So, and that was immediately related to nursing staff. They had nurses, um, nurses who would take care of oversee in an outpatient facility, you know, maybe four or five people who are getting dialysis. They had one nurse taking, looking over a whole room of 20, 25 <coughs> people um, at a time, which is of course how they make their profits. Um, so, you know, we organized, we, we, we picked the fight, we organized, you know, press conferences, we started attending all the hearings, we started really exposing this, and, and we got some, we got a good amount of nurses mobilized to, to, to come to these hearings and to be a part of these press conferences. And, and, you know, luckily, because nurses are the most trusted profession, that, that carries an additional weight, you know, when you have people who are seeing these conditions and, and who you trust and who you, who you who you know are telling the truth, you know, um, to raise the alarm about this. Um, and we also built, you know, our community alliances. We have a great group in New York called the Commission on Public Health Services um, that, that does some really good work around, around public health care. Um, and ultimately, it was too much for them to, no to ignore. In the end, um, we did not only stop the expansion of privatization, um, but we damaged the reputation of Big Apple dialysis so much that we actually got the city to cancel the entire contract for the previous four facilities. <laughs> Which, you know, I've been in this fight for a while. I don't know too many instances where we've been actually able to reverse a privatization and, and go backwards. And so I think it was significant um, and, a, and a boost for nurses in, in that victory. Um, and I wish that was the end of the story, but unfortunately, um, while we were able to save dialysis, um, our city system as a whole is in critical financial trouble um, right now. And I, I want to just take a few minutes to detail some of the history of that and why that's playing out. So starting with Democratic governors Patterson and Cuomo, uh, the rate of Medicaid reimbursement to, to hospitals and other health care providers um, has been systematically lowered um, uh, as the slow bleed um, really turned into a hemorrhage over the last few years. Uh, and then actually, um, with the passage of the Affordable Care Act, the budgetary roof has actually caved in. Um, most people aren't aware of this, but a major goal of Obama's health care legislation was to control health care costs. So while some coverage was expanded and, and Medicaid and coverage was expanded, Medicare, one of the most successful programs in U.S. history, is actually being cut by $700 billion over a 10-year period uh, within Obamacare. Um, and then additionally, there were specific huge sums of money that were, that were fed, that were embedded in federal subsidies to hospitals like ours who take care of the uninsured. They're called disproportionate share funding, um, uh, subsidies, uh, or di dish funding. Um, and these were, these were critical funds that, that systems like ours rely on, um, because we don't get reimbursed for caring for uninsured people. ACA has taken those away, uh, utterly and completely. Um, so, you know, you got the state cuts from Medicaid, federal cuts from DISH and, and Medicare reimbursement, um, and in a few short years, our, our budget problems have gone from painful to really compromising our entire existence um, as a system. The numbers are kind of staggering, and just in the next year, the budget gap for our system is said to be $1.2 billion, um, and over the following um, two years, that's supposed to double um, because um, these funds are being systematically, the, these subsidies are being systematically lowered. 
Um, so the, you know, I think to take a kind of a step back and, and kind of and kind of look at what the patterns are and what are the what are the dynamics. I think the pattern here is hauntingly similar um, uh, with other public services, and I think it goes something like this: you st first, they starve a public service of its resources, and like the CTU says again, by being broke on purpose. Um, and then they create public dissatisfaction with an underfunded system, so they people have to look elsewhere for you know, the, the service that they need. Um, then they spend lots of money on consultants, surveys, setting arbitrary standards that are impossible to meet. In education, it's standardized tests and teacher evaluations. In healthcare, another thing in the Affordable Care Act is tying funding to patient outcomes and patient satisfaction surveys, um, which then um, um, creates, and then, and then the hospitals that serve, you know, um, uh, poor and underserved communities don't have any control over um, how you actually, you know, can deliver that care effectively. So, um, so that funding then dec is decreased, and you're able, and you're not able to actually provide the care that people people need. Then you blame that public service for its failure, which <coughs> justifies further cuts and closures. Um, and I think the final result is less access, less access to service for the most vulnerable communities. Um, <coughs> So there's a lot more, you know, I could talk about, and there's some there's some resources I can point to uh, to people about the Affordable Care Act in particular, and how that's played out in healthcare privatization. Um, but I think ultimately we have to look at the big picture. Um, we need systemic change in our healthcare system. Um, none of this would be happening. Um, None of this would be happening under a fully funded single payer Medicare for all type system. Um, none of this would be happening if the tax rate on the 1% were the same as it was 40 years ago. There would be no budget restrictions. There would be no, um, no need to privatize. Um, and you know, we need to challenge the idea that healthcare should be delivered for profit or, or, to, or to increase revenue. Um, one of the things that they've tried to, the way that the system is trying to get itself out of this budget crisis is by trying to compete for patients with the private sector, trying to be more attractive, trying to rebrand itself. It changed its name from HHC to New York H&H, &H, and all of a sudden they think that that's going to, you know, miraculously bring people in. Um, so it's accepting the premise that patients are commodities. Patients are customers. They've even changed in some of the language that they tell us, patient, you have to, you should treat patients like a customer. Um, and that really undermines the entire idea of what public health care should be. Um, public health care should be uh, health care, <laughs> not um, uh, something that's bought and sold. Um, so, you know, I think we have to draw a line in the sand and we have to, we have to challenge every politician directly uh, no matter which political party they belong to um, that gets in our way. Uh, there's some key battles going on right now. I mean, NISNA is pushing some legislation in the budgetary process to rework Medicaid reimbursements and, um, and increasing some of the federal money um, to our public system. But, and, you know, we actually have convinced, you know, the, the city establishment to, to do some temporary um, money transfers, like, the de Blasio administration gave us a half a billion here, half a billion there to like basically make payroll essentially in the, in the last year. And, and so that's, you know, that's staved it off for now. Um, but I just want to emphasize that more than anything, we really just need to build, build our union army. You know, we need to build, um, we need to build more um, activism and more understanding of the stakes of this fight um, with our coworkers. Um, and, and have the political clarity and, and political will that it that it would actually take to, to take this fight forward. And that's why when I was at this was I was at the strike yesterday, that's why the struggle of the CTU is so important. I mean, it's the one place in the country right now where the labor movement feels like an actual movement, um, like an actual social movement. Like it feels an occupy, like it felt in the Black Lives Matter protests that I was that I've been a part of. It's the it's the one place where. People come because obviously you come to the CTU strike because it's what's important. It's what's going to change things, um, and no matter whether you're a teacher or not, um, and, and then you really get the feel for that. Um, 
and it gives us a glimpse of what we're capable of, even in the most difficult of circumstances. The budget cuts that CTU is facing are very similar, you know, to the budget cuts, the budget situation in New York City hospitals. Um, so yeah, as they say in the in the Spanish-speaking section of the labor movement, si se puede. <laughs> I know we had some folks join us, so I'll continue to introduce, introduce folks. So next, uh, to come before you and tell the story uh, of the American Postal Workers Union and their fights against privatization uh, is Jonathan Smith, the president of the New York Metro Area Local. Let me take a look at my watch. Yes, it's still good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, first of all, I would like to say um, thank you for having me here today. I, Jot down, jotted down a few notes. Didn't want to come in overly prepared because when you're talking about an issue like privatization, I really believe that mostly should come from the heart. And it's easy for me to come from the heart because I grew up with labor in my blood. My grandfather was a postal worker. And my grandfather, I can remember when the um, Postal Reorganization Act of 1970 and how much pride that he had that finally that they got a wage that they could live on. And uh, how young. And I can remember the postal workers, hearing the stories of the postal workers that used to work 40 hours a week and still need government assistance, still didn't have any benefits, you know. And what the problem is nowadays is the young folks, we don't share them stories with them anymore. And we can't stop sharing those stories with the younger generation because the younger generation needs to know what they have today was fought for. What they have today came through blood and sweat. Nobody gave us anything, you know. There's a lot of tired feet out there and sore behinds from sit-ins and, you know, lobbying Capitol Hill. And a lot of times they look at these contracts and they think that they earned something when they haven't put forth half the work. Um, in New York Metro, we have a retiree chapter that I'm very, very proud of because the retiree chapter keeps alive what it was like to get what we have today. You know, a lot of times when they come up to me with different problems on the job, they say, uh, they don't come up there if it's about right and wrong. They don't come, Mr. Smith, they want to write me up for attendance. I said, well, is your attendance bad? They said, well, it's not as bad as Harry's. <laughs> <laughs> they don't understand when it used to be pride when you came to work. You know, you took pride in your job. You wanted to give a good day's work for a fair day's pay, you know? And we have to bring that back. Um, I have my uh, director of organization, Kevin Walsh, here today that's very instrumental in a lot of things we do in New York Metro. I have Nora Hager, <laughs> um, newly married. She's my political legislative director. And we have Mr. Chuck Slacken representing the national APWU, um, the national president, Mark Demonstein, is his executive assistant. So. Um, uh, we have to work this on many fronts. One of the things that I want to talk about is um, growing up with labor in my blood, um, my grandfather gave me a sense of pride in what I do. And he used to, he used to say something to me all the time. He says, um, son, you will be judged on your motives more than you'll be judged on your acts. And see, the, the problem with privatization is it's not the act of privatization, it's the motive of privatization. It's about taking from the middle class and giving to the 1%. You know, that is the motive. And then they want to deceive the American people to think that we want to give you cheaper services. No, they want to give you worse services. And then what, what they want cheaper is for us to do it. They want us to do it cheaper, but they don't want the service to be better. You know, the truth will set you free. <laughs> and, and, and why they, we have to win the fight, not just in our workplace, but we have to win the fight of the American people because what's happening is the government is framing the issue. And the way they're framing the issue, they're framing the issue around big corporations, big money, but most of all, greed. It's greed. And what's happening is when is enough enough? The rich want to get richer. They want to make the poor poor. And the thing is, the only thing that changed it back then and the only thing that will change it right now is activism, you know? 
And we have to realize that when we fight against privatization, it can't be a postal movement. It must be a labor movement because an injury to you is an injury to me. And it must, we must send a message that when you take from one, you take from all. See? <laughs> See, they want to lead us to believe that your problem is not my problem. Divide and conquer is their weapon when it comes to privatization. And if your issue is not directly affecting me, then I'm not supposed to care. And then they'll give me that old line that they like to give all the time, that this is not personal, this is business. Well, I hate to tell them, this is personal. Taking food off my table is personal. Me not paying my mortgage is personal. My kids not getting an opportunity at an education is personal, you know. Me not being able to pay a car note is personal. And we have to start taking the attack against labor personally because no longer can we see it as business. Let me talk about the Postal Accountability Enhancement Act. This was, a, this was an attack directly on the postal workers. And it was a government attack. This was it, and it, it was an attack that was done in the middle of the night. It was a lame duck session, and they decided to push a bill through that would cost us $75 billion for retirees into the future. No company could survive on that. And they did it with some congressmen and senators that weren't, weren't coming back. They did it to some that was on their way to vacation, and you know how it is. If you're on your way to vacation and somebody putting something in front of you, how well are you going to read it? <laughs> Here, here, here. And they signed it, and then they say, the postal worker now from 2006 has to pay $5.6 billion a year. What company can survive with that kind of obligation? But then they tell the American people that the postal service is broke when that is not true. You lift that unfair requirement and we're making money every year. We also need to tell the American public that we don't get one red cent from the taxpayer. We are self-sufficient. They must understand that the Postal Service is in the Constitution because it was designed to be a public treasure, not a personal treasure. And the reason that they want to privatize the Postal Service, remember uh, when alcohol was illegal? They said, oh man, it's killing our children. But then somebody got a bright idea, we can make money on it. <laughs> All of a sudden, did it stop killing our children? But when they made money, it became legal. Well, the postal service is the same thing. They're saying, oh, well, if we can privatize the postal service and you think you can play in it now when the stamp goes up two cents, what you think you're going to do when they privatize it? And they say, $5 to mail the envelope. Yeah. And then they're going to turn around and they're going to say, oh, listen, you thought that email was free? Oh, we got to start taxing you for every email that you send. Why? Because they're always looking for an opportunity to make money. Privatization, the bottom line, is about greed. It's the greedy getting more greedy. And this is what the goal of privatization is. And you have to mobilize your membership, and you have to mobilize labor, because what's happened is they're not educated on what privatization is, because those are not making what you are making, saying you're making too much, instead of saying we're not making enough. We have to get back to the way it was in the good old days. We have to take this battle to the streets. We have to have leaders to stop leading from their office chair. We have to get out there amongst the people and talk to them because the message coming from a shop store is different than the message coming from your leadership. I get on the workroom floor and I talk to the members about the direction we should go. But we have too many labor leaders that have turned into politicians. And the politicians have to go in the labor movement. What is the difference between a labor leader and a politician? A politician goes out there amongst the people and says, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? Well, now I know what I think. A labor leader sees what needs to be done, and my job is to convince you to go that way. And if you're not ready to lead, then step aside because you're not helping us, you're hurting us. And some of the biggest problems that we have within privatization is not just the government, not just these greedy companies, but our own leadership that once they get into a leadership role, all they think about is how can they increase their own salaries instead of how can they help the people. We have to stop 
the bleeding from within before we can look on the outside. We have to stop the corruption at our own front door. And the problem is we're looking so much at the outside that we can't see what's right in front of our face. When will we require our leaders to lead? Enough has to be enough. We must take the labor movement back because the labor movement was built from the bottom up, not from the top down. And we have to get back to that. The Postal Service is proudly the greatest employer of veterans, disabled vet, and women. We are proud of that. The Postal Service forces, uh, the Postal Union forces diversity in the laws that are about that. We, we proudly lobby for more labor rights, like the annual, the sick leave, the pension, and stuff like that. And people don't know these things are bargained, these things are not given. And the Postal Service, the, the government wants to keep the Postal Unions weak, and what they do is they give you the option whether you want to belong to the union or not. And by giving you an option and not allowing the postal workers to have a closed shop, what they are trying to do is they're trying to frame the thinking of the people. Because if, they, if something happens that they don't like, who in this room could win every battle? Can anybody in this room win every, every battle? Let me ask you a better question. Raise your hand in this room if you're married or you have a significant other. All right, tell me how perfect your relationship is. <laughs> Come on, tell me. Is she here? Is she here? I know it's perfect. <laughs> but the truth of it is, this is the unrealistic expectation of our members. They expect their unions to be perfect. What we're striving for is progress. If we're better today than we were yesterday, we're exactly where we're supposed to be. Stop asking us to be perfect, but that message must go out to the workroom floor. Yes. There is no such thing as perfect, but the direction is perfect. Perfection, the goal is progress, and we get better each day as long as we stick together. Because we must understand that it's not your union or this union or that union, it's our union, it's the labor movement, and all of us working together is the only thing that's going to make a difference. <clears throat> now the Postal Service has decided that they're trying to institute programs like Staples, and, and they're trying to get rid of our services piece by piece. And they want to go to Staples and they're telling the American public, well, listen, we're going to Staples because we want to give you more access uh, to be able to mail your packages. This is not true. Now, one of the things I can remember years ago, they had this bright idea that they was going to have a post office in Sears. Remember that? You go to Sears and you can mail any package you want. How many Sears are still around? <laughs> be kind of hard to mail a package right now if the ideas of Sears would have went through, wouldn't it? But this is the, the Postal Service reminds me they're the greatest idea people and they think they can just get an eraser and we'll try another idea. It doesn't matter what, whether it works or not because we'll just throw more, more, more money at it and we'll keep throwing money at it until we finally get a solution. That doesn't work. Nothing works unless you include the workers. Make us a part of the process. See, I have a theory. When I sit down at the bargaining table, I do not bargain for a piece of the pie. I bargain for the whole damn pie. <laughs> and at the end, maybe I'll get a piece. But if you argue for a piece of the pie and you get crumbs, then why can you be upset? Why should you be upset? Because we got crumbs because we keep talking about a piece of the pie. No, I want the whole pie. Malcolm X said one time, he said, if you got a knife in my back six inches, and just because you pull it out four inches, please don't call that progress. Well, this is what the Postal Service is doing. They're pulling the knife out just a little bit here and there, and they want me to believe that that is progress. That is not progress. Anybody that has an opportunity, when we see that you're cutting the staffing because it's more important than them to win the fight with the American people, because when you go to a lot of the post offices, they get mad at the worker, but you don't get mad at management. When you see the lines going halfway out the door, you got six windows there and only two, works, two clerks working. And you say, why is that? Because we have no staffing. There's not six clerks in the back refusing to work. Do you really believe that the Postal Service will allow people to sit in the back and say, I don't want to go to the window today? 
Do you really believe that? They're cutting the staffing so bad that they can't service the American public. And then some of it is bad decisions. When I'm talking about bad decisions, you ever go to the post service and they reserve one line just for money orders? And the other line is going outside the door, nobody in the money order. You think the person in the money order window would say, I'll help you? But they sit there, let the line go out the door, and wait for the one person to come in there with a money order. Why? Because they said, maybe I should call more people. But the manager said, no, this is strictly a money order line. And the reason that they do this is because they want the American people to believe that the Postal Service should be privatized. And they want the American people to think that it's lazy workers instead of bad decisions. It's very bad decisions. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to frame the issues to make it look as though always when you look at the problem, they want the American people to believe it's the worker. No, it's not bad workers, it's bad decisions. Bad decisions at the top. Still, through all this nonsense that the Postal Service does, that they go after maintenance and try to contract out all the maintenance work, and we're fighting them back on that because no one can do it better than us. And they try to go and they try to contract out all of the motor vehicle fleet in California, and we fought them on that. But the thing that you have to understand, the, our biggest weapon, and where we have to understand our biggest weapon is not just postal votes, but everybody vote. We have to have voters registration drives. We have to find politicians that are for us, and if they're not for us, they got to go. Because the only thing that they respect is that ballot box. Martin Luther King said the most important steps you'll ever take is those few short steps to the ballot box. There's never been any major change in this country that was done through violence. It was done through protests and it was done through voting. If you take your right to vote and labor stands behind one vote, but we can't even find a, a sometimes a one person to agree to vote on. Yeah. And, and, and it boggles my mind and, I, and some unions might disagree with me, okay. Some unions might disagree with me, but it boggles my mind how we can support Hillary Clinton when uh, Mr. Sanders has shown that he's for labor all the way. And I know that I'm not up here to give an endorsement, but that was an endorsement. <laughs> Thank you for letting me share. In session this morning, you heard uh, a bit about the resurgence uh, of the uh, United Teachers of Los Angeles. Uh, we're very, very pleased to have with us today Sister Gloria Martinez, who's a special education teacher and active with UTLA. My name is Gloria Martinez, and um, speaking in front of a room of 10-year-olds is a little easier than speaking in front of a room of adults, so if I give you my teacher stare, I apologize before I <laughs> So my involvement in unionism goes back to 89. Um, there was a strike in Los Angeles. I was not walking the picket line. I was a little young and I was a student with LA Unified. But my school was adjacent to Fishburne Elementary in Maywood, Los Angeles. And I remember my parents allowing or welcoming the teachers at Fishburne to use our restroom and to, my dad would buy pan dulce and I thought it was the coolest thing, you know, giving teachers the, uh, giving them a tour of my home and showing them where the re restroom was. So I knew then that, you know, my parents instilled a strong, uh, a strong love for labor. And I remember my dad being a union worker and always believing that unionism was the way to go. Um, so privatization in LA is quite complicated and goes, isn't, you know, we're all kind of here fighting the same battle, but Los Angeles is a hub for charter schools. And, you know, years ago when I was a steward or chapter chair, as we call them in Los Angeles, I found myself fighting a co-location at our school. And this was kind of difficult because at that time our leadership wasn't really organized or prepared to take privatizers. Um, and I found myself having to pretty much within two days come up with some kind of plan to defeat this organization, this corporation. I had no idea then that this was the beginning of something bigger. Um, luckily, we were able to fight off the co-location thanks to parents and um, teachers who rallied around, thanks to a very supportive principal who pretty much said, 
I don't know what you're doing, but you have my full support. Don't ever say that in public. And here I am saying it at Labor Notes. <laughs> so, um, you know, so what happened, what I realized was that when we, when I had to fight this co-location, I realized how unprepared we were as a union to compete with these mega corporations that funded PR members to go and visit schools, to go and speak to parents. They were well-spoken, well-dressed, well-informed, and a lot of times they had money incentives that obviously teachers, we cannot compete. We're spending our money on quality pencils and crayons. So, yeah. amen for that. <laughs> you know, so, and they also promised something better for their, for their children. Now, who doesn't want something better for their children? That's not the battle that I was willing to engage in. What I was willing to engage in was this conversation on why can't all schools offer what is best for your child, right? Yeah. Okay. Luckily, what happened was a few things, and since then, our leadership at UTLA has, um, has shifted, and I feel that we are much more prepared, so I'll get into that, some of that. Um, Later we found out that parents found out that we, that their children who were behavior problems or who were, not, who were not performing at the requirements of charter schools were being pushed back. And rightfully, it, it was happening coincidentally right before testing. So our schools were receiving students April, we were receiving students in March, who then we had to test. And we were finding that those students were nowhere prepared and we started realizing that these damn charter schools are pushing these kids out so that they don't affect their scores. And this really bothers me, especially as a teacher. Um, so now we continue, to fight, we continue to fight the battle against privatizers. We're working on legislation. We are working on organizing. And really, that's where we found our strongest suit. So Eli Brode, um, maybe, maybe you guys have heard of him. <laughs> Eli Broad, for those of you who don't know, he is this mega real estate mogul. Um, he makes those cookie cutter homes, right, one size fits all. And he made a ton of money investing in real estate and at the peak of the real estate crisis. He um, and some of his people developed a 40 page plan in which he was going to invest $490 million to remove half of the stakeholders of Los Angeles Unified, focusing on brown and black children. Now, I have a big problem with calling students shareholders. I don't have any children, but my students, my friends know when I say my kids, they know exactly who I'm talking about. I'm speaking of my students. So, what this did was, with this leak of this 40-page plan, it really gave our union an enemy. So thank you to whoever leaked that. I won't ask how we got that, but that's okay. It was really a gift because what happened was um, Eli Broad at the same time was opening a Broad Museum in Los Angeles. It's this ugly building in downtown LA. And you know, I, I believe he means well. You know, he wants to be this philanthropist. He wants to give art to the masses and he wants to correct the failing school system. But what he did was he gave us a location to organize and a reason to organize. So what we did was at the opening of his um, museum on, in August of last year, we called for teachers to go out there and protest and it was hot, it was really hot. It was in August, Sunday morning, we didn't know how many teachers were gonna show up. You know, mind you, we've had a bunch of battles uh, that we've been fighting, so our teachers were a little tired. We had just started school. We had a thousand teachers show up. Yeah. And more importantly, what it did was the line to get into the Broad was wrapped around downtown Los Angeles, right? So what it did was it gave these people who might not know of our struggles, like this, like they gave us an opportunity to ask us, like, what are you guys protesting and why are the teachers so mad? And you know, we're saying we're not against art. Right? We, we love art. We just think art should be at every school, even the poor ones. Yeah. Right? Um, thank you. We also were able to have conversations with people that we might not normally meet. 
So we obviously can speak to teachers in room, you know, auditorium full of, of teachers, principals, and parents, but getting to the general public, you know, it's, it's more of a challenge. Um, so because of this, we were able to unify people and we were able to let people know about what this plan was doing and dismantling public education. So with a plan in hand, you know, with this 40 page plan, we were able to go to community organizations. Um, you know, it's sad to admit, but UTLA didn't have those relationships before. And we were able to go to community organizations and say, look, we might have disagreed before, and the means of how we get about to doing things might be different, but we can all agree that an attack on brown and black students and an attack on 50% of our student population is detrimental to our whole city. So with this, so with this, we were able to develop a motion that we presented to our school board. Now, um, we have an elected school board. Um, we've won some battles. We've lost some battles. Yes, very important. I didn't realize how important that was until I came to see to you. <laughs> um, some of the people on our board, they are, were, or maybe still are, members of charter school boards. Um, years before, the, this, some of the same people on the board rolled out the red carpet to charter schools. They literally said, welcome to Los Angeles. What can you give me? Because this is what I can give to you. And we were able to go with community organizations, come up with a plan that condemned the Broad, the Eli Broad plan. And we asked, we asked the um, Los Angeles Unified School Board to stand with us. And we, we called it out on a meeting. We asked, how do you vote on standing against the Eli Broad plan? Because this is dismantling our schools and you better believe that it's gonna affect you guys in the long run. It passed unanimously, proud to say that. Um, it was a hard battle. <laughs> Our president, Alex Caputo Pearl, worked very hard, and so did our other officers, in going to community organizing organizations, working with our board members, and realizing that what we have here is a crisis. So now, we, um, what we've done now is we're working on legislation. So that's like our last part of this, right? Working on legislation that is really going to help schools provide, excuse me, <laughs> help schools get the funding we need. Because we realized what this bro plan also did, what it is, it made us look at our schools critically. Like what is causing parents to choose a charter school versus public schools, right? Um, we realized that we need enrichment services, wraparound services. The ratios at our schools, the counselors, the highest class sizes, these are all detrimental, but it's also on purpose, right? We've heard this before throughout this entire weekend, how this is purposeful. You're telling me that a school, I mean a classroom with 60 kids in the poorest neighborhood is not on purpose when across the city they've got everything that they need and they've got class sizes at 30, 32? No, this is on purpose and it's wrong. So because of this, we were able to look at ourselves and say like, what can we do as a union? Because we cannot just say, no, no, no. We have to come up with a plan. So we came up with the schools LA students deserve. And we came up with a plan on funding for our schools, calling for lower class sizes, um, low, uh, higher, excuse me, lower counselor ratios for our high school students. We wanna help them get into college. And more importantly, we want the, to create schools that students want to attend and that parents are proud to send their kids to and teachers are happy to work at. Right. When you have a community in need, you're going to have a school that is failing and you're going to have teachers that are unhappy and you're going to have students that are going to drop out. We need to reverse that. And that's one of the things that this, that this privatization plan did. Even though there's much more to go, the fact that we have been able to become a union that is building for something, it's just incredible. And it's only been 21 months. We, we counted this morning, so I'm excited to see what we can do in the next few years. Um, 
So lastly, you know, one of the things I just want to wrap up with is one of the important things that we're doing now is fighting for legislation to help funding for our schools. We also are building an organizing plan, a strategic plan about how we can get these demands met. We're organizing school sites. We, we're having these conversations, but we've also managed to organize parents around our issues as well because we found that that alliance, most parents believe in their community schools. And it happens, and I see it over and over again, when I visit schools that are fighting co-locations and the parents are there defending their public schools. So I'm, I'm just very proud to be a part of this and I can't wait to see where we head off. Thank you. Union brother from CWA uh, and from uh, the United Campus Workers of Tennessee. Uh, it's called Josh Meiser. Thank you all for having me, and especially shout out Gloria. Unfortunately, I don't do anything as cool as teaching. Uh, I work in the mailroom at UT, <laughs> UT Knoxville. I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee, and like Ken said, I'm part of United Campus Workers, which is affiliated with Communications Workers of America, the coolest union in the US. Uh. <laughs> so yeah, like I said, I work in the mailroom. Uh, I don't teach kids. I, I sort and deliver mail. Um, mm -hmm. And before that, I worked on campus as a custodian for three and a half years in the facilities department. And I kind of came to that work um, after doing student work in a USAS affiliate in Knoxville. Um, and me and some other folks decided that it was really important to continue to be part of the labor movement, um, not just in solidarity, but to you know really get right into the dirt. Um, and that's what I've done. And that's what other folks in our union are doing. Um, so I just wanted to, to throw that out there as something that I think is really important for the labor movement to, to think about and to wrestle with as the, the source of where you know labor activists come from and how we get so. <clears throat> Obviously, I'm here to talk about the, you know, lo our locals' anti-privatization campaign, but I think it's really important to contextualize that. And so the other folks on the panel have talked about their struggles, but I think it's important to say, well, why are we facing, you know, privatization uh, schemes across the board, in all our public sectors, and, you know, public sectors. So I think that the reason we're doing that is because uh, we are currently facing the onslaught um, of something some folks co would call neoliberal austerity, right? And that's a, a project and a response to, you know, the changing economic conditions and, you know, in the, glo in the globe. And so I think that for us, we see that as being um, a promotion by the right of the, the free market as the only solution to government problems. And so to, you know, to convince folks of that, they attack unions and they attack poor people and they attack the folks who need the services that the public sector provides. And so I think for that reason, it's inherently anti-black and anti-woman. Um, and so I, at the same time that, you know, there's this global onslaught of neoliberal austerity, um, you know, at, at the state level in Tennessee and elsewhere, because of the Great Recession and because of this ideology that's kind of overwhelming us, we're also facing, uh, you know, really uh, stark cuts in the public sector at a state level. and. For us in Tennessee, that's been especially true in the, in the public colleges and universities. <clears throat> and so I think that also intersects with another strategy that the right is also pursuing, which is to win by working at the state level, to kind of go state by state and try and get you know, a supermajority and the governorship. And that's happening in 23 states, and that's true in Tennessee. So in Tennessee, we have a Republican supermajority and a Republican governor, Governor Bill Haslam. <clears throat> I think that's because, yes, uh, I think that's important for folks to, to wrestle with and think about because that's 23 states now and that's going to be growing and that's, it starts in the south but, you know, as folks say, uh, as the south goes, so goes the nation. So I think we should have to like really, you know, wrestle with that. Um, and the last thing I'll say about the context is that I, I think that for us in Tennessee, we see the right, and I think this is true elsewhere, as a kind of coalition, um, just like left, left folks form coalitions so that is the right. And for us in Tennessee, we see that as being part of, you know, it's a coalition of socially conservative races and business interests. Um, in Tennessee, that's of course uh, Pilot Gas, um, which I guess you all have here as well in Chicago, uh, but also other co corporations, right? And so that's the context that we, um, are, you know, our union exists in, right? We're, we're facing neoliberal austerity at, the global level and in this country I think we're facing what some folks might call a new confederacy because it's that awful. Right and so yeah. our, our union United Campus Workers you know works in that context 
we're a non-majority union, and so folks aren't familiar with that term. That means that we don't represent the majority. Uh, and legally in our state, we're incapable of doing that. But we have 1,600 members uh, and 16 campuses. So I think that's something we're proud of, given the, the conditions that we face. Our union was formed uh, as a kind of coalition of students and housekeepers and dorms and a, a local jobs and justice coalition. And so we came out of that context of having to work coalitionally. And because of that, we embrace what we you know, would call social justice unionism, which is to say that we have a, a broad political vision behind the concrete organizing things that we do. Um, and I think that's really important for Laban to also wrestle with, I'll say. Right, so I wanna briefly kind of describe uh, what we're facing. Our, our governor, Bill Haslam, the richest politician in the country, wants to privatize the management of facilities for the entire state, um, which is not only public colleges and universities, but also general services, state hospitals, you know, state prisons, to the extent that the maintenance and cleaning of those places is done um, by employees and not prisoners, other places, state parks, just a, a giant, massive, uh, scheme to privatize all of it, and to do that with one company. Um, ironically, one of those companies is based here in Chicago called Jones Lang LaSalle. So, yeah, so that's what we're facing. Um, Jones Lang LaSalle, J-O-L. Jones Lang LaSalle, yes. Right, and so, you know, facilities workers are kind of the backbone of not only campuses, but also, of, you know, the services the state provides more generally. and. It's a lot of people, right? Um, our national union, CWA, has estimated that roughly 10,000 people would be affected by this. Um, it's a lot of people, right? That would mean that those folks were either laid off or had their wages and benefits cut, you know. And we actually, we have no idea um, how many people it would actually affect, but that's an estimate that we have, uh, right? And I think we can also say that, you know, it would not only affect those folks who were outsourced, but also their coworkers and the folks whose services um, they uti are utilized by them, right? I think that the atmosphere that privatization creates in the public sector is one in which folks become afraid that they're next, right? If, if they can do that over here, they can do that over here. Um, and I think it also has meant often that services are worsened. Um, folks who have gone to college more recently probably have experienced privatized food service, and I think that's you know, a prime example of what happens when you do privatize, um, you know, what, what, is this, what should be a public good, but which is not considered one uh, by the right. And I think it also often means that the services that are being utilized are more expensive and less accessible um, to the folks who need them, and that they really exert a downward pull in the community as far as wages go. So we learned about this, um, this scheme by our governor this past August. So it's, we're actually right in the middle of it. We can't speak to a victory yet because we are we are elbow deep. Um, but yeah, so when we learned about this scheme by our governor, we were kind of tipped off by a university administrator who was frankly super concerned. Uh, this person had been a facilities director at other campuses across the country and had seen the what can result when you privatize facilities at a university. And, you know, since we're facing much more than that, he was extremely concerned. And so, you know, after 15 years of our union existing, um, and, you know, during that time being a militant, uh, progressive union, and, you know, winning over the campuses uh, broadly, uh, we were uniquely positioned to do something about that. And so we're like, well, we have to jump right in. And so we did. Um, and we were able to, you know, pretty quickly expose the story and, to you know, mobilize campuses uh, and also the, the public more generally across the state. And so we you know, broke the story and we jumped right in. We had a really big demo, big for us and big for Tennessee. Unfortunately, Tennessee is not, at the moment, known for its giant, massive protests. And so we had a 300-person <laughs> protest on campus, which is you know, big for us. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and so that demo, first at UT Knoxville, where I work, and then across the state, um, at the campuses that we're at, you know, was able to kind of galvanize um, the public more generally around this because when you say out loud the governor wants to privatize everything, that sounds crazy and I think that we're able to capitalize on how just bonkers that is. But we also, you know, utilized um, not only traditional media but our, our Facebook page, Tennessee's Not For Sale, and we 
you know, we shouted that slogan out often, Tennessee is not for sale, because that's, you know, that's basically what the governor is trying to do, is to sell a public good that folks utilize for so many different things. Um, not only the people who work and go to school on campuses, who utilize the public services in other parts, for example, the hospitals that the state has, you know, which are, of course, decreasing. Um, but yeah, so that's, it sounds and is awful. And so, in addition to, uh, you know, these big demos that we had, we also started to, to kind of dog the governor a little bit. I think that politicians are too comfortable uh, doing things like this, and so to make them uncomfortable, you have to confront them where they're at, um, to embarrass them, to shame them. And that's what we've tried to do as often as possible. Um, and so much so that the governor has stopped publishing his schedule. Uh, and so. We also have utilized a pre-existing coalitional space um, that included other kinds of progressive statewide organizations and a variety of uh, labor faith community organizations like Jobs of Justice of East Tennessee and, and other groups um, in our state to hold a week of action in October to say, you know, like, the entire state is telling you Governor Haslam, Tennessee is not for sale. And, you know, that, that ended with a, you know, big uh, drop-in on the governor's office, um, which was terrific, and we were able to show pretty conclusively that the, you know, the folks in Tennessee who utilize the services don't want to sell them, even if you do Governor Haslam. <clears throat> and so, you know, we've continued since then because, uh, you know, as we've pushed back, they've pushed back, um, so we're, like I said, still in the middle of this, and so as we've been doing these demonstrations and making the governor very uncomfortable, we've also been working with our legislators. I'm glad that folks talked about that, because I, I think that it's important for the public sector to realize that the, the folks who ultimately hold the purse strings are legislators, and they have to, you know, hear from us as much as they hear from the State Builders Association and all those other good lobbying people who just have the best interests of the people at heart. <laughs> right, and so uh, building those relationships uh, with our legislators, both Republicans and Democrats, we were able to, um, you know, realize that, that this plan is because it's so crazy is not one that the Republicans in our state are totally won over to. And so, I think that you know by holding out an olive branch, so to speak, w with folks who would not be our traditional allies, we've been able to win over some of those people. And in fact, one of our biggest champions is a, you know, uh, a Republican. And that's, that was shocking to us, uh, given the, the tenor of the party in Tennessee. Uh, but I think that's something to think about and wrestle with, is that folks who may not seem to be your, your natural allies in a fight or could possibly be one. And, and so that's, that's led to us being able to have uh, our, our allied legislators hold public forums across the state and allow a member of ours, Tom Anderson, uh, to, to speak at a, you know, a state senate hearing. That wouldn't have happened um, if we hadn't, you know, really shook it up a little bit um, because they aren't trying to give access to our union, um, to workers generally uh, at the state level, to really, you know, to speak to the issues that we're facing, and that's really unfortunate. And so where we're at at the moment is that um, our pushback has led to their pushback and their saying, oh, we don't know, you know, this, y'all need to hold your horses, you know, it, nothing's decided, we haven't signed anything, but you have to wait, you have to wait, and so I think we can see that as a victory, but also, um, because if no one existed, it would have happened already, you know, we'd all, you know, be working for Jones Lang LaSalle and making 725, and regrouping, yes. Right, so I think that, you know, I want to speak a little bit on, on strategy, because I think that's something that our, our union has had to wrestle with, uh, in this fight is how do we, you know, fight an enemy that's much bigger than us, that's much more powerful than us, right? The governor himself is worth like 1.2 billion and the party is the super majority, right, in our state. So I, I think that we've ha tried to utilize as much as possible um, the fact that the Haslam, in this case, and I, it's probably, this is not universally applicable, right, but Haslam is kind of stupid and <laughs> In addition to being stupid, he's also, like I said, very wealthy, and um, those two things are actually not to his advantage, although they certainly got George Bush elected. <laughs> right, so he is to us the weak link, and right, and so we're trying to, to attack the weak link in the new confederacy in Tennessee, cool, um, to kind of split the party a little bit. I think that, um, like I said, the, the party in Tennessee is made up of super racists and rich people, 
And if you can drive a wedge, you might be able to get some space for yourself. And that's currently where we're at, right? Um, we are driving our wedge into this, this ugly force in our state, but we haven't won yet. Um, but even though we haven't won, I want to offer some, some lessons and conclusions uh, that we've drawn that I, I think that we can share you know, with the folks here. The history of our union has convinced us of the necessity of working as a coalition. Uh, I think that should be true of all public sector um, unions and you know, work organizations across the country, right? Because the folks who provide the service and the folks who utilize it you know, there is a bond between them, and they are natural allies if folks can see it. They're not in contradiction to each other, right? And so for us, that means working with students, um, USAS affiliates and other, other students, and also the communities, because the public sector uh, provides jobs, and those jobs benefit the community that surrounds it. And so we've also conceived of this fight as a, a united front. Um, not just in the sense of a coalition, but also in the sense that you have to unite advanced forces to win over the broader public. Um, and I, I think that if you don't see a fight as that, you won't win it. Um, and concretely, that's been uh, for us to work with uh, students on campus and across the state who are currently fending off an attack by our, our wonderful le you know, legislature to defund uh, diversity initiatives across the state. And so that's an ugly thing that's also happening at the same time that we're fighting this privatization battle. And we have to see that those, their fight is our fight, and we have to stand together. And we've done that concretely um, through shared lobbying share, and shared actions. I think it's also important to frame the issues that you face in your public sector union as broad social issues, because the wages that I make, which are very low, and that many campus workers make that are very low, actually affects not only us as people, but also the local economy and other people you know, who depend on those services, right? Poorly paid workers don't always get the best service. Um, I certainly don't always get the mail right. So I, I think it's also important to um, use the, the media to speak more broadly. And I think that's something that uh, unions often get and sometimes don't get. And if you're framing your issue uh, as you know, a broad social issue, you can do that. Um, but if you are letting the media drive the narrative, you won't, you won't communicate what you're trying to communicate. Uh, I think that um, also uh, using the institutional access that you have as a public sector employee and um, the information that you can be garnered from that as well as the fact that many public, you know, the things that happen in the public eye are often FOIA-able. Oh, sorry, that's an acronym. Freedom Information Act, you can FOIA things. Um, and I think it's also, uh, speaking to uh, our legislative work, important to really garner relationships with uh, legislators that uh, happen in district and are more personal and they're more able to be picked off or isolated in that sense as opposed to when they are grouped together um, if they're unfriendly at the state level. And so there's some lessons that I, I guess I would offer to, to folks. And I would say that if you wanted to know more about our campaign, we have a table here, um, United Campus Workers, Tennessee is not for sale. And yeah, you can come talk to us about ways that you can help us out if you'd like to. Thank you.